Welcome to Rock Management Insights, the videocast interview series of University of St. Gallen's profile unit, Responsible Corporate Competitiveness. My name is Katharina Klöckner and today I'm here with Rolf Wüstenhagen. He's professor and um, director of the Institute of Economy and Environment at the University of St. Gallen, where he also holds the chair for management of renewable energies. He conducts research in the field of renewable energies and today he will talk about strategic choices in energy investment and the question what we can learn from a behavioral finance perspective. Rolf, thank you so much for being here today. Pleasure. In your research you address um, the challenges related to strategic choices in energy investment and by explaining these challenges you use terms like status quo bias and path dependence. Mm -hmm. So could you please explain to us what you mean with these expressions mm -hmm. and uh, where do you see or where can you observe the central challenge in mm -hmm. it? The energy sector is currently undergoing a fundamental transition. We now have an energy supply that is based on 20% renewable energy and 80% non-renewable energy. Mm -hmm. And uh, many observers now feel that this needs to change and that perhaps by the middle of the century we need to have the opposite relationship mm -hmm. like an 80% renewable, 20% non-renewable mm -hmm. energy supply. So there's a big change going on, there's a lot of uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And economists have figured out that when people make decisions under uncertainty, um, they don't quite follow the economics textbook models mm -hmm. of full rationality, um, but instead they do what, what Herman Simon in the 1950s has coined as bounded rationality. So they act under bounded rationality, time constraints, incomplete information, and when they do so, one of the consequences is they have certain biases, and one of those biases is called status quo bias. So when people take decisions under uncertainty, they're more likely to stick to the status quo than to go for a new path or to, to adopt innovation, for example. And on a collective level, the number of these status quo biases in individual decisions lead to what's called path dependence in innovation literature. So um, there, is, there are certain paths, um, innovation paths or technology tra trajectories, which are not that easy to deviate from. Okay, so what would you say is the central insight of your research and why is it important? Mm -hmm. One of the areas where we first observed that um, phenomena of, of status quo bias and path dependence was venture capital, mm -hmm. venture capital investment in energy and other areas. And uh, we started out with a re research project a couple of years ago where we looked at um, where do venture capitalists actually invest their capital. And if you looked at the distribution, like you see here on the graph, a few years ago, it was heavily skewed towards a very few, uh, no, a very small number of industries. Two thirds of all venture capital investment went into just biotech, telecom, or information technology. And if you were looking for energy technologies, um, they were very far down the list. Um, in the single digit percent range. So the question was actually why why is that? Um, is, can that be explained by, by traditional terms of risk return for example? Um, so we went out and um, surveyed venture capitalists asking them for what might be the reason for, for these big changes in, in, in the allocation of, of venture capital. Um, and in, in those interviews we could find, yes, that there are certain risks that are maybe higher in energy. Um, for example, technology risk. Many of these energy technologies are very capital intensive to develop and take long lead times. Um, whereas you can set up a software company from one day to another and grow it very quickly. Um, also in terms of regulatory risk, there are certain risks in energy. Um, it's a very policy driven sector. Um, and venture capitalists tend to be a little uncomfortable when it comes to policy risk. Um, so that could partly explain the, the difference, but again, then there's also ways of mitigating or managing those risks. Um, you can manage technology risk or long lead times by adopting new business models, having licensing instead of having to, to invest in, in, in a whole factory, for example. You can manage regulatory risk by diversifying or by trying to influence policy making. Um, so risk alone couldn't quite explain this order of magnitude differences. On the return side as well, well there was an argument that maybe um, investments in energy couldn't make the kinds of, of returns that some of these famous um, IPOs in, in the traditional venture capital sectors would, would, would um, provide. 
Um, but then again, if you looked closer, there were some deals, um, like for example, Plug Power in the US or Q-Sales in Europe, which earned venture capitalists very, very decent returns. Um, so there were also success stories out there. So risk return alone couldn't quite explain those order of magnitude differences. And there needed to be something else behind those big num number uh, differences. And that something else um, turned out to be, to be very well explained by path dependence. Um, for example, uh, one of the, um, it, it, it takes a lot of time to sort of build up the competence to invest in a certain sector as a venture capitalist because it is a sector, it is an area of high uncertainty. It's hard to tell which firms will actually succeed in the market. And, um, and it takes time to build up that competence. It also takes effort and, and money. One of the venture capitalists that we talked to said it takes $10 million to educate a venture capitalist and a, a venture capitalist learns by making a couple of bad investments in a, in a new industry and then after that he knows how that industry works and will continue to invest successfully. But if it takes $10 million to educate a venture capitalist you don't easily move into new sectors. Hence there is this, this phenomenon of path dependence and people have a, a bias towards sticking to the status quo, sticking to where they always invested which was biotech and telecom. Okay, and uh, what implication does it have? Uh, that means what would you recommend uh, practitioners willing to apply this basic idea? Yeah, well I mean first of all on a, on a sort of macro society level um, if you think of this transition from 2080 to 8020 this big uh, investment in renewable energy that's that's probably going to occur um, then there, there is an issue if you if you if if investors have a hard time moving away from the existing path and, and tend to stick to the status quo um, but also on a firm level there is a challenge because there are big opportunities in in that new investment area of renewable energy and in order to to reap those uh, rewards you actually need to to overcome path dependence and need to sort of be able to to move into new industries um, it's not just an issue with venture capitalists, it's also an issue of, of corporate investment in energy, for example. Um, now, when you look at, um, for example, wind energy as an area that has seen particularly high growth rates in the uh, past couple of years, and you look into the uh, entry timing of some of the incumbent firms, um, you see huge differences in when those big firms entered this emerging wind energy industry. Um, for example, GE was one of the first in 2002 who actually entered the wind turbine industry. Um, Siemens, their close competitor, followed two years later. And um, Alstom, another similar company in the electrical engineering area, took another five years after GE to actually enter that same industry. Now in those five years, the wind energy industry continued to grow by 30% a year. Mm -hmm. So you can imagine that a company that was as late as Alstom um, missed on opportunities. So overcoming path dependence is really an important issue um, if you want to benefit from the opportunities in this gr uh, growing renewable energy market. Mm -hmm. So you referred to the relevance of status quo bias in decision of investors, companies, mm -hmm. policymakers. Mm -hmm. But um, do you have other examples where this applies? Mm -hmm. Well, in addition to the venture capital and the corporate investment examples that I already mentioned, um, there's two other areas where this is very prominent. One is um, policy making. Um, I happen to be a member of the Swiss Federal Energy Research Commission, which advised the Swiss government for a couple of years. Um, and then at the end of my, my six year term there, I compared and looked back and looked at how did we split our research budgets. Um, and if you look at, compare for example, the amount of money that was spent on research and development in nuclear energy, one of the incumbent forms of energy versus wind energy, one of the fast growing sources, um, you could see that there was an order of magnitude difference between those two. Um, we invested over those six years an amount of about 240 million Swiss francs in nuclear energy research and about 1% one, 1 of that, about 2 million um, on wind energy research. And I was wondering, well, I mean, why is that? Isn't there a similarly big opportunity, market opportunity in wind energy? Um, is it a matter of risk return as traditional economics would suggest? Or is it a matter of path dependence? Is it maybe a function of the budget as it was six years ago? And then there's some changes in the, in the, on the margins, but um, the, the, the distribution remains largely unchanged. So this graph here shows a, a similar um, development in, 
in, for, for Germany and you see that status quo bias in energy research and development investments is very much present there as well. And then finally another area where this applies is consumer decision making. Um, an area that we investigated was um, the choice of consumers to, um, to buy renewable energy or, or green electricity as it's also referred to. And if you look at surveys, um, you will find that some 80% of the population often say renewable energy is their preferred energy source. But then if you look at actual market shares, it's often more in the 5% range. So 80% want it, 5% buy it. Why is that? Um, and again, a very strong influence here is, is status quo bias. Mm -hmm. So people stick to what they've always bought and they're just, um, well, maybe they, they hesitate to, to get involved and, and, and overcome all of the effort to, to buy a new um, product. Mm -hmm. So finally, let's come to the research basis. Which kind of research have you conducted to support the argument in your insight? Yeah. And why do you know that your results are valid? Sure. Well, the, uh, the observation that path dependence and status quo bias is a, is a very prominent role, um, plays a very prominent role in energy investment decisions is based on eight years of research where we've conducted surveys with both venture capitalists, other investors and consumers. Mm. Um, so we find that in our research, uh, it is also based on my practical background. I used to work in the venture capital industry and was also a member of that uh, um, commission advising the, the Swiss government. And also we find it very much uh, present in executive education. When we talk to people in our executive education program on renewable energy management, this is really an eye opener for them. So they actually have examples of status quo bias in their own firms in their daily lives. Um, and they also realize that overcoming path dependence is, is really a key issue if their firms and they themselves want to participate in this high growth renewable energy market going forward. Mm -hmm. Okay, so thank you very much for your insight and thank you very much for joining us today to talk about your insight. This was University of St. Gallen's Professor Rolf Wüstenhagen with his insight on the role of status quo bias in energy investment or in strategic choices in energy investment. For more information, please visit our website rocc.unisg.ch.